what I kept seeing was that we're predisposed in the West um, to be done in by these challenges mm. because we want to do things our own way. It's the way we feel comfortable. It's the way we, we um, feel is the route to success. But the only route to success now is to listen to people different from yourself. To the Harbour Grace excursion with the most to have. Looks really safe in my life. So first of all, um, I just want to thank you for this book. Oh. Yeah, thank you. And you're all going to want to thank Barry. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, once you have, you're, you're going to want to thank him too. Um, and it took a few years. No? Did, this this did. particular book? How many it years? Did. Well, it depends on how you look at it, you know. Um, Give me the most dramatic rendering. 74 years. <laughs> <laughs> there uh, is hope. <laughs> no, I, uh, it, you know, the first thing I want to say is that it's an accident of appearing in public with a book like this that um, it, it's difficult to get around the fact that it's not about me and it most especially is not about me as a lone figure. I've had good teachers all of my life, many of them indigenous people, and I couldn't start talking here with you without recognizing that the advantage I have had by being informed by people way smarter than I am. So that said, probably five years, mm. um, I knew when I signed the contract for the book that it was way in the future, uh, and I was thinking about it for a long time and deliberately doing some things that I intuited would become important, were, were things to do. Mm. But once I sat down at the typewriter, does everybody know what that is? <laughs> but, um, you do it without electricity, and you don't push a button to change anything. So. You use a manual typewriter. I, I do. I've used a manual typewriter since I was able to move my fingers in a coordinated way, although I don't type. I, I really, when I'm really going, I've, I use all three fingers. Yeah. I, most of the time I use, I use two. Wow. So you um, must have very strong grip. You know, I, I'm, uh, I've got a little bit of trouble with arthritis, but interestingly enough, yeah. after all of that typing, my hands are great. I don't have any arthritis. Well, you're exercising them all the time. I, I, every day. So it took about five years yeah. from the day I sat down to begin the manuscript and then take it through uh, a couple of drafts. That is kind of amazing because the scope of this book is absolutely staggering. You... Let me just say, you haven't, if you haven't read the book, so you cover a life. You say it's not about you, and, and like, unlike a lot of memoirs, I mean, you, it is much more sort of outward focused, but you cover a life, you cover a fair chunk of the planet, you, you observe the world in close-up, you take a wide-angle lens, you turn your attention to the bottom of the ocean, outer space, you look back in time to the beginning of the origins of humankind and right. beyond. Right. You look, you have a weather eye on the future. Right. And somehow you create this integrated whole that is so intimate. You keep the reader right here. Uh, can you tell us maybe a little bit about the original vision and how the book took shape? Well, uh, uh, let's see. Everybody goes about this in a different way. You do it your way. <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm thinking about a, a Uruguayan writer who's passed away now, um, Eduardo Galeano, yeah. who defined the writer as the servant of memory. And I asked him once, does that mean that the writer is the servant of her own memory mm. or is the servant of the memory of her people? Mm. And he said both. Mm. So that's been a guide for me. Mm. And I think I've been schooled in the responsibility, the ethic and the social responsibility of the writer by indigenous people to the extent that 
That's really, in some way, how I understand the world that the writer lives in. What I knew I wanted to do was address darkness mm. um, of, of every sort and global climate change and whatnot, but also in the West, disintegrating democracy and <clears throat> what's happening now in Brazil and Hungary and, and frankly, in the United States um, with this mania for nationalism. And uh, what I kept seeing was that we're predisposed in the West um, to be done in by these challenges mm. because we want to do things our own way. It's the way we feel comfortable. It's the way we, we um, feel is the route to success. But the only route to success now is to listen to people different from yourself yeah. and to understand that all cultures have an intellectual tradition or an ability to maneuver easily in a metaphorical world that at this time is um, indispensable. So instead of having a group of people come together, all of whom grew up in more or less the same cultural environment, you bring people who grew up in very different environments and you deal with people who are grown-ups, you know, people who, as a man said to me once, no longer need to be supervised. Mm. They can be trusted to take into consideration everybody's needs and put their own needs last. Mm. Um, to do that, you need to, you need to have intimate um, contact with, with other peoples. And that's, that's pretty terrifying. Mm. Um, because you're, you're kind of naked in those situations and, um, and very vulnerable. If you're not vulnerable, why are you at the table? Mm. So I, I, the way I began to think about it was make the confined space of the need to do something bigger. Mm. So everywhere I went, I was trying to push, 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 open, open, open. That's why that... The narrator it was me, of course, but he's always looking up into the sky and always behind his binoculars and sitting through cycles of day and night. It's just to make the space bigger. My responsibility is not to develop policy or answers to anything. I want women and men who are really good at that mm. to have a big stage to work on. And that's one reason that the book ends in Antarctica. Right. And every time I was there, I, there's no human history really to speak of uh, in Antarctica. It, it's a kind of, um, there's physics and chemistry and virtually no biology except at the periphery of the continent. And in summer, when it's the only time you can really work well in the interior, there's light all the time. And I thought, well, with maybe something like this, the reader would be thinking about a tabula rasa. Mm. So you've been through the Canadian High Arctic, you've been to the Galapagos, you've been to Northern Kenya, you've been to Australia, and now these ideas can stimulate a, a reader, or I hope that they do, to imagine what they think would be, what would the path look like from here to the horizon? How would they imagine that? Hmm. I'm glad that you brought up imagining because it's such an important uh, part of the book. You circle back to the necessity of the imagination yes. throughout the book. It's a pattern that arises. And there's this idea of, you know, I mean, people can think of imagination as something that's a bit of a frill. <laughs> but in your book, you, you point out that how necessary it is to our survival. Yes. Imagination and story. Yes. The role of story. I have a very dear friend, uh, this sounds horribly like name dropping, but <laughs> he and I have known each other for 40 years, and it's the American composer John Luther Adams, who won the Pulitzer in music in, in the States uh, two years ago. And part of our discourse over the past 40 years has been trying to understand how the pattern of arrangement of tonal values in music and the arrangement of words on a page, where's the crossover? Mm. And we, one day we found that we had very similar ideas about landscape painting. Mm. 
mm. and how how that art evoked place and how it failed sometimes to evoke place and was just two-dimensional and pretty. Mm. Um, so I think as a sculptor or a choreographer or painter, um, photographer, you're, you're trying, you're, your search is for a pattern that, that will help. Mm. So it's not, you're not the person who's telling us what to think, God forbid, but you're making a pattern in which it's possible for people to use the power of an imagination to clarify what they, what they most sincerely wish to do. I'm not talking about a job. Mm. I'm talking about the, the way in which you take care of your children, mm. um, the way in which you serve your community. Mm. Um, so for me, the power of imagination is, is stimulated by art and some people who have really remarkable imaginations can and can apply them in their own field of expertise and come up with things that that we need to come up with mm. we're on a really short rope you know i think um, global climate change if you if you've never been really far up north in canada if you go you'll you'll just stand there silent with your jaw dropping the changes that have occurred up there since I was working there writing Arctic Dreams are, I, I don't even know how to begin to explain it. it. It's staggering. And I'm seeing those changes on my own landscape in Oregon. Now I'm watching, uh, I'm watching a huge change take place in the woods where I live that's all due to global climate change. Mm. So I don't want to, I, I want to help people understand, look, time is really short and we're really in bloody trouble. Mm. And we need to do something that requires an enormous imaginative approach. We should be asking ourselves today, what comes after capitalism? And what comes after this nation state thing from the 19th century? Neither one of these things is is taking care of us, they are helping us destroy ourselves. Yeah. So what are the alternatives? What are the alternatives? Um, I don't know, you offer this, like really early in the book, the closing line of the prologue, you have this jumping off point into the book. And it's like a wish and a warning. I want everyone here to survive what yes. is coming. And to me, there's so much in that line I mean, it, in some ways, it's a terrifying line. Um, and you don't pull your punches on that, and why would you? But it's also, to me, there's a lot of love in that line, right? It's a very, and in fact, all throughout the book, there's, there's a lot of love. Yes. And it seems to me that in, in this book, but also in everything I've ever read by you, there's this continual act of keen observation and paying attention that feels to me like one of the most important types of loving that we can do in the world. Is that, does that ring true for you? Yes, yes it does. And uh, I don't, uh, you know, you, it, it's possible to end up being somebody that, um, if somebody points it out to you, it, it comes as kind of a shock. Mm. Um, but then you immediately say, but I, I, that's, I don't know any other way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tell a little story that I found amusing. At my prep school class uh, had a 50th anniversary and we all got together in New York and uh, a fellow that I didn't know very well from the class, but who was one of a group of 15 of us that went to Europe right after we graduated in 1962. Wow. <laughs> and we had a beautiful little Fiat bus and we went to all the iconic places. We started in Portugal and spent 10 weeks before we ended up in Western Ireland. Wow. And uh, so this guy says to me, you know, I remember you on that trip. You would always sit in the first seat so mm. you could look out the window and mm. then you'd always write down the mileage of the 
and, and you'd write, you'd, you just kept writing things down. And um, so I, I guess that's what you went on and did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Begin as you mean to go on. Um, yeah, t so I don't know, uh, I don't have a picture of what it is that I do. I know that I, I could use the word ferocious, mm. uh, ferocious attention to detail mm. and to other people's lives. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I, I obviously have spent a lot of time traveling with Indian people and Eskimos and Aboriginal people, but the, you know, I'm also a creature of my own culture and um, my wife and I are talking about, I'll be in New York next week and she called me last night and said there's a new Miro exhibit at MoMA mm. and so we're both talking about how excited we are to to see that. I, I love my own people. I want them to do well, but I also want everybody to get through what what is coming. Mm. And, and that everybody extends beyond humanity. Absolutely. And always has in all of your writing. Absolutely. Everybody who's here with us. Yeah. Every yeah. every living thing. Um, if you don't if you don't create a society that includes animals in the same moral universe that you occupy, uh, sooner or later it's going to collapse because it has no integrity. Right. Well said. Somebody take that down, please. <clears throat> um, so you've mentioned spending time with different indigenous peoples in your travels. Right. Um, there's just a lovely moment in the book that I wanted to mention. There's a group of Inuit hunters who give you a nickname, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce. Can you pronounce it? Navaratsuk. Navaratsuk. Okay, I did attempt it. Um, <laughs> this is a certain kind of bird. Right. Can you tell us about it's that bird? Ivory. Ivory gull. Yeah. It's a white gull. And uh, I think at first glance for white people, they would say, oh, well, they called him that because he's the white person in the group. But it's, it's something way more subtle and interesting. And that is when I'm traveling with people, I'm doing the things that everybody's doing. I'm part of the group that's moving across a landscape. But I'm also kind of taking little notes and things like that. Not, not very often, a lot of people, especially when you're hunting, do. I don't like somebody taking notes because they know they'll pay for it later, possibly. Mm -hmm. So um, if you see gulls uh, on, I mean, I don't know how people will feel about this term, gulls on a gut pile. So you butchered a whale and there's a gut pile on the ice. Um, Big gulls, glaucous gulls and, and blackback gulls, and the, the larger of the gull family, will be in there uh, on top of it, shouldering each other out of the way <laughs> like this. And then the ivory gull, which is also a small gull, mm -hmm. will stand at the edge of the chaos and wait for an opening and then boom, boom, like that. <laughs> so that's why they gave me that name mm -hmm. because he seems to be fully participating in every way, but he's, he, then he just backs out. Mm. So that's, you know, they saw that I was in my own way making room for stepping back and seeing the whole scene, and then I'd be in it, and then I'd step back and watch the whole scene. So they got it right. I would say they got it right, yeah. and um, part of the sweetness, I think, of traveling with people who are not like you is that understanding that you're a major source of laughter. <laughs> yeah. uh, and you can't, you know, you come from the dominant culture and you've suppressed people who are you traveling with. Culturally, you've done that, not you, but your, your people. And um, it, it, when those moments come, I remember one time I was with a group of uh, Kamba men in northern Kenya they aren't from northern Kenya, but they were working in northern Kenya. For Richard Leakey, we were looking for hominid fossils. And in our camp, there were there's, uh, these five Kamba men and myself and a young Turkana man who was a local man who uh, cooked for us and kept camp while we were out bush. And we would get up every day at 6 o'clock 
um, because between 6 and 6.15 is when the flies were waking up. Mm. So breakfast would be ready at 6 promptly, and if you didn't want to eat flies for breakfast, you made sure you had breakfast before these flies came out of the stupor of the night and began to get... Feel. Yeah, they're them. looking for moisture on your mouth, so... Mm. If you didn't want to be doing that while you were trying to eat your breakfast, you got up at, at 6, and then we were gone. Um, but because the sun was brutal, um, every morning when I got up and got my gear together, I'd always, the last thing I'd do is put on sunscreen. So one morning this man, Wambua, <clears throat> who's always a little bit taciturn, that was his way, and uh, he he deliberately stood as though he were exasperated by, by what I was doing, and he'd do this. He didn't have a watch on, but he'd just go like this, and, and then make a gesture like this. So, you know, he, the morning that he did it, we all just cracked up. You know, we all doubled over in laughter. The moment is sweet because you know we're in this together. And I understand that I'm white and you're not. And, and actually, that's pretty funny. <laughs> because then you can go on with a sense of equal standing in the world. Mm. Um, I remember another time, an Aboriginal man, I was trying to learn the Pichin Jinjara words for certain plants. Mm. And I would ask him. And he, he thought this was hilarious because my pronunciation was worse than abysmal. And so he began on his own to go to plants and give me the name, and then he, he just watch me try to say it. <laughs> that was the best part of his day. The best part of his day, and also in some ways the best part of my day. Yeah. There's no feeling like being loved for who you are. Yeah. And in so many of these situations, um, we, you know, it, I, I, I don't know, I don't want to start to cry about it, but... Um, I've been in some difficult situations, really bad weather, um, really, really dangerous sometimes situations, and you get, you get through it, you come out on the other side, and you embrace, and when you embrace, um, it has to do only with the celebration of the fact that you are alive and that you care for each other's fate. Yeah, it and it, it down and to it can happen in a, a split things. second. You know, I got yeah. I took a trip once from Perth or from Sydney to Perth on the Indian Pacific. The train takes three and a half days to get across Australia, and being me, I I asked the porter if it was possible for me to ride in the locomotive. You know, I wasn't interested in <laughs> sitting in my room at, so he said, "Oh no, no, you can't can't do that," and. Uh, so I pressed him a little and he backed off and he said, well, you can ask the engineers. So I got off the train in Sydney and ran up to the locomotive and asked them, can I go with you? <laughs> um, and they said, yeah, sure, we're going to stop about 15 miles out of town, take on a lot of water, just step out on the platform like you're having a cigarette or something and just casually walk up to the locomotive and come on up here with us. So most of the way across Australia, I was up there in the, in the locomotive with them and it was difficult to interview people over the sound of the engine, but um, we we just we just touch each other yeah. like this in a in a moment. We know we hardly were just on a first name basis because nobody bothered with a surname, and we were enthusiastic about life. And somebody who was a total stranger was respecting what they were doing with their lives, mm -hmm. running this train. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you could feel yourself expand into the fullness of yourself, and you were encouraging the others to expand into the fullness of yourself, your own passions and desires and ideas. So one day we ran into a rainstorm. A, a horrific flood of water came out of the sky, and the windshield went just like this on the train. We're going like this, and it was just solid water, and they never cleared off the glass. And... The storm was short-lived, but I noticed when you looked out the side, you didn't see that much water. You saw the impact of somebody moving at 70 miles an hour or whatever it was. Mm. 
So the sky cleared, double rainbow came out, and then about a hundred kangaroos came racing alongside the train, bounding, 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 and all of this light glittering in what was left of little pieces of water, and this heartbeat of the, the, uh, the rainbows. And we all looked at each other, and we had the same emotion. Whatever it is, we are in the middle of it now. And the involuntary gesture everybody made was to shake hands. <laughs> <laughs> like we'd created it. But, but the, the exchange with, with other people who, um, who have aspirations and have families and worry and um, become exuberant about some things in their lives, you, you share that with, with other people. And the kangaroos are such a beautiful part of that scene. I mean, I feel like I almost floated <laughs> when that scene came along. I just almost floated up out of my chair. Me too. Yeah, I wish I'd been there. Um, you mentioned, you know, uh, scary things in the book, scary things that you're facing up to, um, to do with where we are in the world, but also in your travels. Like, there's curiosity all the time throughout the book and throughout all your work. Right. This nature of curiosity, but curiosity doesn't get you too far without courage. And you do stuff, you do scary stuff. So you just mentioned the mob of kangaroos. There's one time when you're uh, diving in the Galapagos, and mm -hmm. you're down about 80 feet, and mm -hmm. you roll around and you look, and 30 feet above you... Sharks. You know where I'm going with this? Yeah, hammerheads. Hammerhead sharks. 60 or 70 hammerhead sharks. Big ones, too. Big hammerhead sharks. <laughs> a lot of teeth. <laughs> like, imagine you're down there 80 feet below and 30 feet above you. Right. This is what you see. But your description of it is so beautiful. It's like there's you, you look through them to the surface, and they're like a lattice. So in that moment, are you feeling fear? No. No, because you're no. overwhelmed with... Yeah, because I'm overwhelmed. Yeah. I remember actually being conscious of this feeling. I, uh, um, long time ago in Alaska, in Nome, uh, a group of people from California got off the plane at the Nome airport in baggies, T-shirts, and flops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they bring their California with them. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they were divers from a postdoc program at... Um, uh, Moss Landing, California, and they were the people who had discovered uh, how gray whales feed on, on the bottom. Oh, yeah. And I knew about red papers about that. And they, they sort were, of suck up mud, right? Yeah. They roll on their sides and inhale the bottom and filter it through yeah. so this mud plume is coming out and they're taking all the bivalves as they go along. Mm. Um, so I was there because to fly with another group of people uh, from uh, the Navy, um, watching bowhead whales migrate uh, through Bering Strait and on into the Beaufort Sea. And so we were out every day, um, dropping microphones through the floor of the plane to listen to bowheads and these big leads and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So we do that all day long, and then to come back at Nome at, at night, of course there was no night, it was summer, and I, I got interested in what these guys were doing. So I said, can I help? Can I go out with you guys? Yeah, sure. So they wanted to find out how walruses feed. And so went out on the, on the research boat with them in the evening. And I really liked them. I mm. liked their attitude and what they were doing in the way of, you know, a 14-year-old boy, I would say, that's really cool. <laughs> So I'd watch them do that, and they, we struck up a friendship, and they said, you've got to come dive with us. You, mm. You've got to come work with us. So I, I did get certified uh, as a diver, and I began diving with them, and we saw really magnificent things. But they work every year in Antarctica, mm. and they said, you've got to come down. There's a bunch of tests you know, and certification process you've got to go through, but come dive with us there. It's really wild. So I did, but the first time, you know, there's a, a about a meter wide hole through two meters of ice, mm. 
Mm. And there's no way out once except yeah. that when you come out. And I really, I really was scared. But I, but I knew this. If you do this, you will see something magnificent. Yeah. And then I just got over that uh, hurdle and was staggered by what I saw, mm. by this, this display of life. There were 100 to 150,000 organisms per square meter on the bottom. Mm. And that, I couldn't get enough of it. I couldn't wait to dive again the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day. To be, to see life that, uh, where there's been very little research and to, to get out, uh, get up on top of the ice and start to take your gear off and meet the eyes of the other person. You don't need to say a thing. Everybody mm. gets, wow, mm. wasn't that something? And let's do it again tomorrow. <laughs> so I was scared then. Yeah. But, you know, it, in, but it was worth it. It was worth it. And I, uh, the th a thing I've been more afraid of, I guess, in my life than probably anything is I, I never wanted to be in big water mm -hmm. offshore, mm -hmm. you know, 60 foot seas and things. No, thanks. But, but you didn't stay on shore. Like you, you have. I did. And I had a friend who said to me uh, that he had crossed the Drake Passage in 60 foot seas. And he said, I saw the face of God. And I thought, sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it did happen that way. Yeah. I, I had my oldest daughter with me, um, and m virtually everyone on the ship was uh, deathly seasick. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I didn't get seasick. Wow. And then uh, in the middle of this uh, Beaufort Force 11 storm, I went out on the fifth deck. We were, and we had 50 foot waves breaking over the top of the ship. But he was right, you know. And one of the most amazing things about that moment was I've got this death grip on the railing, and I'm there with a friend, a famous explorer, mountain climber guy, and we're right, we're right up against the edge of it, and we're, and we're just burning with enthusiasm for it. And not further away than this first row of people were albatross, mm. and they were navigating in it. Navigating, yeah. and they just look at us like, I, <laughs> furious winds blowing and whatnot. They just, they're just biting it out and watching you and your boat. Yeah. <laughs> you bring me to one of my favorite moments in the book. Um, there's a certain bird that you see, you come across in the South African savanna. And it's looking away from you. And, it, oh. and then it turns to face you. It's a bird with a very evocative name. Yeah. Um, and Pale chanting goshawk. Pale chanting goshawk. And you, you speak about when, whenever you feel like you might have to give up, you think about that bird. I do. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. It, um, we were camped somewhere, and I was walking, and way out there, like the end of the auditorium, I saw this bird, and it was a stillness against the sky that had the shape that would draw your eye immediately to it. Hmm. So I put my binoculars on it, and I knew it was a pale chanting goshawk. And it was just sitting there on the tip of this tree, and I knew it was hunting, and I felt admiration for it, and appreciated the uniqueness of its way of life. And then I hoped to not, it had its back turned to me, and I hoped not to disturb it, but to get closer. And I got to a certain distance, and it turned around and looked at me, and then it turned back to what it was doing. And its um, left eye had, had been torn out, it had been raked out of its head. And it's a bird that needs depth perception in order to hunt and to make its living. And for me, in that moment, it was regal and indifferent. Mm. They didn't care about me. I was just something coming along on the ground toward it. It didn't panic 
it went back to what was important to it. And I, I think part of the part of the part of what happens when you become involved in the non-human world is that um, it's so metaphorically rich. Mm. I mean, a bird with no depth of field still hunting with this matted blood f bloody feathers on the side of its face and no eye. It, it's so metaphorically rich that if you enter that world, you automatically think, and how is what I've seen telling me something about myself? Mm. And I think traditional people do that without language, without talking about it, mm. just noticing things that are exemplary and represent um, a, a various kinds of integration in the world. Not so, having the compartments in the first place. Yeah, no silos. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to think about it. So there would you know, come moments of despair in my life where um, I just thought I was too stupid to tired, to full of despair about this fellow in the White House in, in, the, in the States. And I would think of that bird. And it was like the bird was saying to me, and what's your excuse? <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 it, it really helps me understand why traditional people are always always watching out there, you know, I was, I was staying in a village one time on St. Lawrence Island with a man, and whenever we talked about something, we always sat in two chairs at a table next to a window. He was always sitting next to a window, mm. always looking, always watching what was happening out there. You're carrying on a conversation, but it's always with reference to what is not in your world that, that the the conversation resonates. You know. There's us, and then there's all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But that's the amazing thing about this book, is that somehow you write about all this other stuff. I don't know when I've read a book that, that covers everything so well. Yeah. And um, this act of empathy, imagination, love that you circle back to through the book from so many different directions. I mean, the, the most wonderful thing is that the book is practicing what it preaches throughout. Oh. So I really, I mean, I will just tell everyone, you know, you have to get a copy for everyone you know. Um, because it really does show us a world that is worth saving. It, it's also a world, I think, worth living in. Worth uh, living in. It's, uh, you know, if you walk down the street here, you, you, any, you, anyone you meet can tell you a story that'll break your heart. Yeah. And you can see the loneliness in people's faces. And uh, when I see that loneliness in someone's face, um, you know, I'm not a doctor, but I, I do have that feeling that at, right at the beginning of the book, I want everybody to be okay. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want anybody to be like me or believe like me or do what I do. That's who needs that, who needs one more of me, you know. But I want them to find what it is that elevates their heart um, and, and create an environment in which um, they can thrive. You know, in, <coughs> in the Eastern Canadian Arctic, the language is called Inuktitut. And the word for storyteller is isumutok, and it means the person who creates the atmosphere in which wisdom reveals itself. So it, it, it moves completely away from the importance of the storyteller and, and settles quietly and strongly on the idea that it's the story. And if you can tell a story, that helps people understand what they mean by their lives, what they hope to accomplish, not a job or something. But um, I watched a man who was an old classmate of mine two nights ago when I arrived in, in Toronto. Um, we were gonna have dinner and he's, he said, would you mind if I asked my daughter to join us? And I said, no, no. 
and she um, talked about her, she's an artist, and she talked about her work, and uh, she got up to use the ladies' room at one point, and I turned to him and I said, you are not able to understand how happy I am to see what a good dad you are. Mm. And that, the, the way an adult takes care of a younger person in, mm. in so many subtle ways, that's the stuff with which you build, not your own ideas and your own program for everybody. Back to love. Yeah, it is. You know, that's such an abused word of... Um, we'll take it back. But it's the key to everything, yeah. you know. It, it, it is a declaration of reciprocity as the force that is holding everything together. I love you, and coming back reciprocally, I love you, and this is how I show it, or this is why I am having trouble showing it. The force that's holding everything together. 